Here. Anthony. Here. Jace. Danielle. Here. Lauren. Here. Thunder. Here. Richard. Here. Rachel. Here. Rebecca. Here. Caroline. Here. Xavier. Here. Megan. Here. Scott. Here. Alexa. Here. Bailey. Here. Ethan. Here. Kylie. Here. Kira. Here. Jane. Here. Olivia Lynn. Here. Olivia Lopez. Here. Madison. Here. Kelsey. Here. Sabrina. Here. Lane. Here. Oh. Diana. Here. River. Austin. Here. Tanner. Here. Lindsay. Here. Jose. Here. Desiree. Here. David. Here. Olivia. Here. Devin. Here. Casey. Here. Angelica. Here. Sean. And Taylor. Here. All right. And uh, Lane, would you see me after? Nice to have you. Dr. Berkman, you ready? Okay. <coughs> Please take it over. Thank you for being here with us. Um, today we're talking about the uh, terrestrial runoff of sediment and nutrients. Um, this really, uh, I just have to start by. Uh, Showing you this word in Hawaii, and you probably all know it, but um, coral reef scientists around the Pacific use this word, ahukua'a, and the Pacific Islanders had a much better uh, concept or uh, understanding of ecosystems, I think, than people on the continents, because you had from the top of the ridge down to the coral reef within view at one time, and their extended families or vi villages would, this would be their jurisdiction in, under one big watershed, or apuhuaha, yeah, I knew that word for years. But anyway, it's very important because it, it relates to today's subject, is that if you're going to have a marine protected area for corals, and in most cases, if you're near a continent or a high island, you also have to take into account the management of the land nearby. I just wanted to show you this apu. Ahu Kauaa map of uh, Oahu. Anyway, uh, I always like this slide. This was an East German scientist who had a hard time traveling, but he went to Okinawa, uh, Dietrich um, Coleman. And he went around and found all these different sites. You had very little coral compared uh, in areas that were um, farmland or urban areas compared to areas with uh, plants or forest on the shore because the forest keeps the soil. Uh, it doesn't cause much nutrient runoff. And so in the 1960s um, and 70s, uh, sedimentation was the problem coral reefs have. We were not into overfishing as much and not into uh, climate change and bleaching. It was sediment um, was, was the subject of a lot of research. And this is an area on Guam that we were studying. And we had uh, uh, little tubes that captured uh, that the sediment was set in. So we could measure how much sediment was being deposited out this small river. And it went towards the mouth of the river, out towards the reef was this way. But it increased as it got in close. But when that happened, the total number of coral species dropped down. You only had like varieties mounds in here, and then you started <laughs> adding them uh, at an exponential rate. Out here you had all kinds of uh, over 100 species in this small little area. Out here you only had two. And also the percent coral cover was as well as how many kinds of coral, uh, just how much coral decreases as you get close to the source of sediment. Um, and it's not just the sediment that lands and uh, actually on the corals. It's, it's also resuspension. Um, um, Mike Field over in um, uh, Molokai uh, on the reefs there noted that if sea level rises, because you could tell what happened when you have an extra high tide, if sea level rose only a few centimeters, it would the uh, higher water coming in would stir up the uh, sediment that's there and put it in over the, in the water over the corals. And when you have resuspended sediment, um, 
the largest corals and also the average maximum size of corals and also the average growth rate uh, decreased as you had more resuspension. <clears throat> and this is another study that shows the same thing, the log of the suspended particulate material and the growth rate. Uh, the more material you have in the water, the um, slower the corals grow. Now, how is this? Well, first of all, when you have sediment laying on you, the coral can't shake it off. It's got to produce mucus and carry it off with a cilia, and it takes energy that it should be putting into growth or producing eggs, but it has to get rid of this sediment. Another thing is, is resuspended material makes the water darker, and so the zooxanthellae in the corals are not as a, uh, photosynthetically active. Another bad thing about it is that when you have sediment on the coral, this uh, uh, nurtures bacteria, which makes it more susceptible to disease. And just the drain of energy, and the, both from having to get rid of the sediment and also the less energy you're getting because of the cloudy water is uh, inhibiting photosynthesis, uh, you're putting energy into get, taking care of yourself and disease and competition are growing fast to take your place and the amount of eggs you produce are all reduced because you have to spend uh, energy dealing with sediment. <clears throat> and it also uh, inhibits recruitment because a, a big coral, even though it may take energy, is able to withstand sediment uh, to, unless it's really bad. But remember when a coral settles, it's, it's just a little planular um, millimeter too long and then it becomes a very tiny polyp and sediment can easily uh, smother it. And also uh, it buries the metamorphosis recruits, but also remember the corals larvae are often reacting to chemical cues from coral and algae or something that signals that this is a place to settle and it, it's not going to get that if there's sediment between. It also does this in the water column. If you have suspended materials, it's been shown that it interferes with the cues to settlement, and it can also uh, get, uh, bundle up fertilization and sperm getting to the egg. And we already said it reduces energy for those in belly, and there's cost for the little ones as well, not just the big ones. The little ones are really critical. They got to get big as fast as they can to protect themselves from being overgrown by other things or by algae or being smothered by sediment. And so, as you can see, for the 1960s and 70s, sediment was pretty much the problem corals had in, in the scientific world. Uh, this is just, even here, remember the uh, second talk I gave, uh, Acropora is much more sensitive than most corals to sedimentation, just like it is to everything. I just wanted to show you, this is the University of Guam Marine Lab, and every time we had a heavy rain, you could just see the thick dirt, uh, um, tons and tons of sediment come down the river and go way, way offshore. It just covers a lot of things, partly because, especially at this time, way miles into the middle of the river, they're building a big resort place, and so there's a lot of construction. And so, and this is on Guam. I'm, I'm, I'll get out of this pretty soon. I show uh, sedimentation on high islands is a real problem in the Pacific. The hunters like to burn the uh, grass and forests to get fresh growth because the uh, deer don't like uh, old, thick uh, growth. They like the nice, fresh growth. And this isn't very good for the farmers. Uh, these are called badlands. And you can see the roads are especially bad for uh, sediment for the sides here. Look at these roads. I, I wouldn't drive my car in there. Anyway, here's just some data to show. This is metric tons per acre. That's not that much per year. And so on a road surface like the one I showed, is 320 in the Ugin watershed. This is one of them watersheds on Guam. It's not necessarily the worst either, but it's 324 tons per acre are washed off into the ocean. And uh, Badlands is 243 tons. 
And it's, it was getting worse over the years. Uh, I first got there in 1975, and in about um, 18 years later, you can see um, uh, it doubled the amount of erosion. And the level is more than doubled. And not only was the erosion per road per year more, but there were more roads. So erosion is a real problem on Guam. And just for the coral reefs of the world in whole, uh, when the soil is lost, it's, uh, there's many things that we're doing that we just don't think about. It takes a lot more time to repair than it did to get rid of it. And so uh, when we wash uh, soil into the ocean, the soil takes uh, 10 to 40 times as long to be remade. Um, this is the same as the aquifers. When you empty an aquifer, you take the water and you go all sorts of places with the water. Uh, it doesn't fill up near as fast as it was empty. But this is a, and when you overfish a population, the fish take a lot longer to come back. Anyway, uh, these are some, <coughs> that, that, I'm, all this is about is that sedimentation, even though we're now interested in global warming and overfishing, it's still a major problem. And even for us, uh, this is the world's arable land per person, 1961 per person, and then now uh, half. Now, this is a little bit tricky because it's not only are we losing the trout soil, but the population is growing, so you're getting per person the amount of farmland is going down fast. Okay, I'll get back to coral reefs. The, the interesting thing uh, uh, is that 80% of the sediment that goes into the ocean worldwide goes in off of the East Coast. And this is uh, less than uh, just a few percent. Um, so why is it that a negligible amount compared to the East Coast goes off the West Coast. Part of that is because when the um, world is turning uh, in this direction, uh, the trade winds are really kind of coming south because the warm air raises off the uh, uh, where it's warm in the tropics and gets up, cools off, and makes this big cycle. And, and as it goes up, it has to be replaced by other air. And that comes in from the north or from the south, depending on the side of the equator you're on. And so it seems to be just like on a train. The trade winds are actually just coming from the north. But since the Earth is spinning at 24,000 miles per day, uh, we're going into it. And so it makes the trade winds go from uh, east to west. When that does, it pushes away water from the continents, and that causes upwelling. The main upwelling, there's lots of little upwellings all over the place, but the main upwelling areas come from the west coast because the trade winds are blowing this way, and if you push the water away, it's going to be replaced. As it comes over the central of the ocean, um, the, this is thousands of miles, and so the phytoplankton gets very rich where you bring up nutrients from below the photic zone. And, but when they're going along the surface here, they're taken up or they die, and it becomes very thin here. There's not many nutrients in here. When it comes to here, you've got the uh, trade winds are coming across the ocean and picking up lots of moisture. And so when you hit the continent, you go up. And as you know, when like in the uh, windward side of Oahu, that, that air goes up, it drops the rain. And so you have an awful lot of big rivers on the east coast. Or on the west coast, a lot of the nutrient comes up as uh, upwelling. <clears throat> Just to show you how important nutrients are in the ocean, um, this 1982, there was an El Nino, and, and that was, by the way, the first bleaching. Like I said, for the 60s and the 70s, we were interested in sediment and nutrient runoff. But in 1982, um, Peter Glynn found the first bleaching that's of any major size. I mean, it's the first real bleaching. And it went all the way from Mexico to the Galapagos. It was 1,400 miles of bleaching, and that was the first one. And so it was really confusing people. 
people say, what is this? A disease? Or, you know, and finally figured out, well, El Nino made a very, that's the first real warming that caused the leaching. But what it really did, too, is when you don't have the nutrients, the whole system collapses. So this was a sardine fishery, but when it collapsed in 1982, it, um, it stopped the whole tuna fleet. There's just no fishing that year. It's called El Nino, starting from about there, I think. But the, it killed 17 million seabirds out of 18 species in the, in the islands in the eastern Pacific, and it killed uh, many uh, sea lions and died of starvation. And the point here, though, is uh, when they had this um, sardine population collapse, the whales are hit, hurt bad, uh, seabirds are hurt bad, uh, sea lions are hurt bad, and the fish. So we, we got to remember, and I'm kind of getting off the subject a bit here, but when we're fishing for things like krill and sardine, we shouldn't overfish them. Not only are we losing, but all sorts of other animals are losing here at the base of food web. Now, this is kind of a boring slide to look at numbers, but uh, on the nutrients, on the this is back to corals now. Uh, I put out, when I went to Panama in uh, 1970, I, the Pacific and the Atlantic are only 55 miles apart. It's only about an hour and a half. But the Pacific is full of whales, whale sharks, tuna industry, so many seabirds you're afraid, afraid of getting hit by poo, the, uh, all over the place, and, and lots, of, lots of fish. And then on the Caribbean side, all up and down the coast, most of the Caribbean, it's very nice clean water, a few dolphins, and the, and the fishes are there and diverse, but they're just not in so much abundance. Anyway, I put little settling plates out on both sides, and that's why I've always been, everywhere I go, I think of nutrients because of that first experience on coral reefs, and I, I went and was in Panama where I saw it. It's just two different worlds because of the upwelling. But you can see here on the... Um, Upwelling plates. This is on how much biomass accumulated uh, in a uh, couple of months on the plate. And you can see here on the dry upwelling, it was quite a lot. On the opposite side from upwelling, there's still nutrients there if I get around. But on the Panama coast, if you're right at the marine lab there, right on the coast, the water's pretty murky because of runoff from land. It was still pretty high, but if you went in the San Blas Islands or a group of islands where they're off the coast a bit and the water is clearer, you don't get much nutrients. Um, it was much less. Now, what does that have to do with corals? The corals grow fine here. If you see a big one, it's doing great. Uh, it, it, it does very well in upwelling water, but there are just so few corals. And on the settling plates, I only found two in all of the, I did couple hundred plates, and I did in the Caribbean, just there were a couple hundred little corals. The difference is that on this side, things like suspension feeders like barnacles and sponges and then algae, which takes up nutrients, just quickly covered the thing, and the coral, the little polyp, just doesn't grow very fast. So this is a problem corals have with nutrients. Is it directly? I mean, the, the, there might be some if you get some studies, but it's not really that big a deal. What is a real problem is everything else grows so fast. And so, in a way, nutrients are good for corals, but not if you got too much. Everything's good in moderation. And sorry about, I, I know, just, I'll, I'll just show you what I want to see. I put settling plates in the Caribbean down the depth gradient at 110 feet, 65 and 30. And in shallow water, there's fewer, even though that's a better place for corals because the zooxanthellae get more light. But they seem to do much better at intermediate depth. And even though they actually uh, grow faster in the upper grip, they, why don't they grow in shallow water when they're actually growing faster than they are? They grow slower if you go deeper because the zooxanthellae does not have as much light. Um, and 
It's because the same with nutrients, only this time it's light. And I'm just sort of bringing light in that nutrients and light are the same sort of thing. If there's too much, the algae just really does very well. If there's too much nutrients, it makes phytoplankton and those suspension feeders do very well. So corals have to start a little deeper. Now they do much better. There's lots of things in nature where they do much better somewhere else, but it's just the competition that they actually live most of their lives in a sub-optimal environment. Uh, famous is, of course, uh, in ecology, you heard of Connell's uh, thesis work with barnacles. And the little barnacles of families grow high on the inner tidal, and they're nice and zoned. But they do much better down low, but they just don't grow there because they get eaten or they're preyed upon. Well, the same thing with corals. Uh, corals do much better at 30 feet. They grow faster. But they <coughs> survive better here just because of the competition. But another thing they do is on these settling plates, they have a top, a side, and a bottom. And in shallow water, they 25% of them are on undersurfaces and 60% are on the side and relatively few are on top for the same reason. If you're on top, you're competing with algae. And also, you might be getting sediment. So this is the problem with uh, sediment and nutrients. Is sometimes it's hard to tell exactly which is the problem. I mean, if, if they're really burning <coughs> the sediment and it's clouding the water, it's probably sediment. But sediment comes with nutrients. And so in this case, I think um, there wasn't that much sediment. It was just competition. And so they live on the side. But in deep water, they're back on top because they don't grow very fast in deep water, 110 feet, but neither do the algae. And the, they can start holding their own against algae and growing comparably fast that they can get big because they have the advantage. They also can take some heterotrophic food. They, they eat, eat the plankton, the zooplankton. Partly is for nutrition, but partly it's to have the um, nutrition for the zooxanthellae, that it's a system where the zooxanthellae aren't exposed to the water to take up nutrients, and so they get the nutrients from what the uh, coral eats. It's a very nice system. And um, just to show you, remember when you went across the Gulf Ocean, if you're next to a continent or a high island, or you're especially upwelling in this case, or in a harbor, you get lots of nutrients. And so what the corals are competing with are, in this case, barnacles or uh, heterotrophic sponges that grow fast in upwelling water. And so here you can see the barnacles are growing all over the coral in the Galapagos. And this is in a harbor in Pompeii in Micronesia, which is in the tropics. But in it's surrounded by a um, barrier reef. So you've got this lagoon, and an awful lot of nutrients are washed off that high island. However, an American Samoa, or islands that are in that part of the ocean that are oligotrophic without upwelling and without much nutrient runoff, uh, you have the competition here. This is a uh, so a uh, uh, sponge, unlike this one, which is suspension feeding. This gets a lot of its energy from cyanobacteria in its tissue, just like corals get energy from the zooxanthellae. And this is a, a city, a little green thing encrusting, and they get their uh, energy from prochloron. It's kind of like a blue-green alga, except it has chlorophyll. And, <clears throat> and then they got some big, this is in Palau. You have a, a, a tunicate um, that has uh, pretty, pretty thick but it lives off the uh, prochloron in its tissue. The thing is, when you get to the middle of the ocean, where a place like American Samoa, there's, uh, or Palau, I remember going out once with some other scientists, and we were walking along on this reef flat, and suddenly we kind of realized there's every animal here has zooxanthellae or uh, cyanobacteria, some plant in its tissue, even the ascidians, as you see here, the sponges, the uh, upside of the jellyfish, the uh, uh, corals, of course, but also even the uh, opisthobranchs had it in their tissue, or at least they captured it. But we, we had to look around. They saw a crab or so, but very few animals 
did not have this because there's just not that much nutrients in the water. So they recycled. Now, here's a study uh, where you have a eutrophic area, and here is less. And you can see that the number, this is the number of corals that started in this study that they were showing. Like here, there's two. And this is the number that were killed by uh, either overgrowing with algae or smothering by sediment. And algae is nutrient sediment that's smothering. And you can see uh, in the eutrophic area, there's much more mortality than the less eutrophic area. And oh, this is percentage, I'm sorry. This is percentage. And here it's a bur burrow by sediment is this much in here and that algae overgrowth. And again, as you have a eutrophication gradient, which sort of seems often eutrophication implies nutrient, but it also involves sediment, but the diversity goes down. Now, there's some other ways. Remember, the interaction competition, if you have nutrients, then the algae and the suspension feeding animals uh, can outcompete the coral. Um, there's something I'm leaving out. Of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. When you go to American Samoa or to Micronesia, <clears throat> there's barnacles around. But they're tiny little things. Uh, they just can't grow because they're using energy, <clears throat> excuse me, to get water. You know, they, they take energy. But if you have a crinoid, they're doing fine. They just hang there and let the material in the little zooplankton. They don't, they don't work for it. They just capture it. Um, so crinoids do fine. But you have something like a heterotrophic sponge or a um, bivalve, a mussel, or a barnacle, corals do much better because they got a pretty steady supply of nutrients by recycling and just capturing a bit and letting, living off the photosynthesis. But the barnacles just don't get big in the, in the central Pacific, but they're huge. I mean, they're almost this size in, a lot, in the Galapagos and places. Um, fellow did a study went around the various um, museums and had corals from different areas in the literature how much primary productivity there was. And he went to museums and counted how many boring bivalves there were in those specimens. So, and if you have an awful lot of primary productivity, you have an awful lot of boring bivalves. And if you go to a pretty oligotrophic place like the Tuamotus, um, they don't have much bivalves because they're not energy. Just like I said, bivalves have to pump. They have to work to move the water to get the food. And it's a loss if you're pumping oligotrophic water because you're pumping a lot of water and getting very little nutrients, very little plankton. So this is in a lagoon in Pompeii where we already saw when you had that big sponge <coughs> living on coral. <clears throat> There's lots of bivalves boring in. And if you ever see these, they look like little dumbbells. <clears throat> Those are lithophaga, a boring bivalve that were just two cyphers coming out. And it's very regular. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> if you go in a lagoon or near a river, you're going to see lots of these little dumbbells on, on the bivalves, uh, siphon holes in the corals. But if you're out on a very nice oligotrophic clear reef, you don't see so many. One real classic case of um, many years of uh, nutrient input is Kaneohe Bay. Um, this is a record going back to the 1700s. First they had agriculture, which of course causes sediment. But then around 1940, um, the uh, Naval Air Station or the Marine Air Base uh, put out a pretty good sized uh, sewage area. And then Around 1963, there was another area of sewage, and you can see the percent coral cover went way down. There was also urbanization increased after World War II, about 19, mid 1940s, uh, and land development really started going up. Um, and then in 1979, 1980, they diverted the two big um, sewage. 
places, and sure enough, the corals come back. You don't if this sewage new, uh, puts nutrients in the water, which causes a lot more phytoplankton, which clouds the water for the zooxanthellae, but also it's good for the benthic algae. Um, recently, or relatively, um, uh, there were some big freshwater storms, and I think it was 2006. It wasn't so much, it was sort of 42 days, that sounds like Noah, but it's 42 days of rain. I don't think it was so much the water, but it was just cloudy. And so the, the uh, I didn't get to it yet. Um, <clears throat> back before the, about around the 1960s, um, this Dictyosphyria, it's a very bubbly, balloon-like algae really started covering things. It's the same place that started really covering the algae, or the corals. And um, the, when the sewage was taken away, it didn't really go away. Um, it did after this cloudiness. And I, John Stimson says the reason it doesn't go away is maybe because there was all this nutrients and it got into the interstices and stuff, but they covered it so well that they had this supply of nutrients that they were hoarding away. I, I don't know, but that's why, why, why didn't they go away right away? Anyway, this is Dr. Hunter's, from Dr. Hunter's paper, and this is the corals uh, before they diverted the sewage in 1977, 78, this is 1971, the corals were less. When they diverted the sewage and the plankton went down and to some extent the algae were not quite as competitive. Well, they're still pretty competitive. Uh, the corals are much more. The uh, Dictyosphyria is the opposite. Back in 71 with all the sewage, it was out here and it's kind of gone back. It's a little complicated story, I'll let you tell. <clears throat> now, another thing that's interesting about nutrients on a large scale from human perspective is hospital records are pretty good. People weren't going around and surveying corals all over uh, Indonesia back in the um, <clears throat> 60s and 50s and 60s, but when they started um, <clears throat> um, Forestry. Whenever they started forestry, the records show in the hospitals that there would be deaths and uh, or hospitalizations of humans from paralytic shellfish poison. So the nutrient from the runoff came into the ocean and stimulated uh, dinoflagellate blooms. That's just a, the, I'm just showing the scale of it. And um, I think the most spectacular. Uh, nutrient input and lack of in both directions is the Aswan Dam. It's about 600 kilometers up the Nile from the uh, Alexandria, where the fisheries would be in the whole eastern uh, wind. <clears throat> this is the fisheries. And when they put the Aswan Dam, it's cut off the nutrients to um, the, that's the main source of nutrients for the eastern Mediterranean. So multinational fisheries just crash down to something like 4% of what it used to be. And they basically, the Aswan Dam just stopped commercial fishing for all practical purposes. But the farms down there were used to getting the nutrients from the Nile were also put out, and so they started fertilizing. Well, after a while, the fertilizer was running off, and also sewage from uh, Cairo and Alexandria and places. So fertilizer and also sewage started enriching it. So now the fisheries is uh, about three times greater than it ever was. So that's a real case of nutrients make ecosystem differences. It, on just one river, uh, it can drop down to 4% of what it was naturally. But then when you start subsidizing it with human fertilizer and sewage, it can go up several times more. So it goes in both directions. And this is the main thing on uh, fertilizer. 
uh, it causes, and in the Midwest, the whole Midwest is sort of draining extra, excess fertilizer nitrate, nitrates into the Gulf of Mexico, and it causes these big dead zones. And for the world as a whole, nitrogen now is probably double what it's ever been in the history of the Earth, because um, they now can make it. It takes an awful lot of gasoline to produce fertilizer because, like I said, it's very hard to fix nitrogen. But they're also very wasteful, so you have all these dead zones. And this are these are dead zones from fertilizer, and these are from uh, the global warming. It's stratifying because the uh, warm water rises. <clears throat> And so it just stays on top. And without that, you don't get oxygen mixing down below. And there is an oxygen layer that's, that's pauper in oxygen, and it's grown double the size. And so some, some tuna, big eye tuna will go into it, but most of the others are coming in shallower, and they're easier to catch. So part of the reason we're running out of fish is because they're coming in shallower because of the large areas for low oxygen. Another problem for us is we're cutting the forest. We're re relying on the oceans to produce oxygen because the phytoplankton are about something like half of our oxygen production. But if we cut oxygen from being absorbed, warm water not only doesn't hold as much oxygen, it also, without mixing, doesn't take it up. So the oxygen is going pretty fast. And without the phytoplankton and without forests, we might gradually be getting kind of bad. Now, Remember, uh, I was kind of leading into this with fish. If you can tell when you're going to have a good year, it's when you have a lot of outflow from a place like the rivers, like the St. Lawrence Freeway, uh, Seaway, St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, when you have a big flow of nutrients out of that, you know in a couple of years there will be a good harvest of scallops and <clears throat> In several years, you can get a harvest of pollock and stuff. Uh, you give them time to get to a harvestable size, count back, and you can predict by how much nutrients are coming out of the water. Well, one thing I was, I was noticing, a very unpredictable aspect of coral reefs is success in recruitment. And one of the most spectacular are echinoderms in general are very boom and bust kind of animals. But this is the crown of thorns in American Samoa, and they, they can just really be abundant and devastate the area. That's how clean they clean the corals of their tissue. And they're very, they, they can climb on, and their stomachs are very elastic. They go out and wrap around like a vacuum cleaner. And here's the coral they're heading to. Look at the big line of them, a phalanx. And here's what's left of the coral reef. But they're very irregular. Like in the Solomon Islands, they were 1930, American Samoa, 1938, and then again in American Samoa, 1979. So there's usually decades between the time you'll have an outbreak. <clears throat> and in between, they're pretty rare. Um, and, uh, we got Dick Wass. Uh, Dick Wass was there, and he was a fisheries biologist, but he, he was an American Samoa, but he was an avid shell collector. So he went diving just about every weekend. And for the whole year, when we talked to him, he said that whole year preceding the outbreak <coughs> in November of 1979, he, in fact, it was two years, he, he could count the number of crown of thorns he saw of all that diving, and then all of a sudden, they got over half a million in just a month or so. Um, this is uh, they had a um, uh, bounty on crown of thorns, and that doesn't work for a number of reasons. I don't know if I have time to get into it. He first saw them, uh, 83,000 was an estimate on Pima Bank offshore. But here are the number that were collected for the bounty. And then they ran out of bounty money, and you couldn't really see the difference. But they, they got 486,933 by bounty and you couldn't see the difference. So I, we know there's over half a million, but uh, I, I got to go there later and got those pictures, you know. They, they got almost half a million, and look at how many are still there. 
So bounty doesn't work. Another problem with bounty, by the way, uh, you don't ever use it on Crown of Thorns, is in Okinawa, they had a bounty for 12 years, and they looked back at it. They said, what we've been doing, if, if we let them finish, they, they usually disappear. There's not many corals left because they're dead. But by collecting them, we keep the little uh, spawning crown of thorns alive because we're collecting them fast enough they got plenty of food. So they've been spending money for 12 years and got something like 10 million uh, paying bounty for it. And it really wasn't paying bounty. It was kind of uh, harvesting them. And nobody wants them. And they're salty, so you don't want to put too much on, the, on your garden. Uh, well, here's some topics. Okay, well, why in the world does it come every 30 years or so? Well, one thing that was noted is, in the American Samoa especially, is that there was, uh, no, uh, but, oh, I went to Noah. They had a little office there. And Noah's really nice because they have all of the rainfall records and all these kind of things on little pamphlets you can get going back into the 1900s. And so we had decades of rainfall data. And we noted that the three years before the Crown of Thorns outbreak in 79, that whole three years was a, you know what, maybe it's just yeah. Well, it was very dry. It was a record drought. And then they had a tremendous rain, which in fact killed people because it was so much rain on dry soil it caused a mudslide and buried some houses. And so it was a remarkably unusual, but it just stood out. And then it went back to Guam, and their outbreak was in 69, and the same thing. It was a long dry spill, and then suddenly you had an extra heavy rain, which washed nutrients. And if you have constant rain, like the Amazon, pretty much the soil is wet. It doesn't just sort of gummy. It doesn't go. But if you have rainfall following a drought, it just washes out really easy. And so you can see there's um, one chance in a thousand of this coincidence, all those years, and just uh, and it went to other places like Guam. Uh, and uh, forget the other place, American Samoa, there were six. And they all had heavy rain, none of them, where there was less of without heavy rain. Um, <clears throat> OK, another same thing. Another thing, OK, so that's when you have dry followed by a heavy storm of uh, rain to wash it out. Another thing was noticed uh, when they had the one in Guam, it was all of Micronesia. And so Westinghouse um, surveyed, um, sponsored a survey of all these islands, uh, about 45 islands. And about half were high islands, which have runoff, and half were atolls, which, you know, you just have this uh, coral reef. You're not going to have nutrient runoff. And so 20, uh, 19 of the 23 high islands had outbreaks of crown of thorn, but only two of the atolls did. And these two atolls happen to be the most close to a high island the right down current, like a Kua is next to Chu, only you can almost well, swim at night. You can't do that, but it's just a couple of kilometers, a few kilometers. And then there's Ant next to Pompeii. Pompeii is very, very uh, rich in the lagoon. So it's possible that these two were actually influenced by the high island next to But this is the, the other aspect of it, is all of these are intermixed. And somehow you only have outbreaks near high islands and not near atolls. And so it might be the nutrients. Um, another thing that was curious is if you go to these islands, the high islands all have names for crown of thorns, as opposed to other sea stars. But atolls. A couple, well, they don't really have a name for it. They're just the spiny things and kind of lump them in with the sea urchins. So obviously, they're part of their culture. If you're on a high island, you occasionally get an outbreak. <clears throat> so here's the life cycle. And a real question is, why in the world is it this complicated? I mean, I don't see the selective advantage of 
doing this, but you get the Hague and then um, subdivision and then uh, give you a canaria larva. And then the brachial area larva is when they start to feed. And that's when they need food. They make a little, a little starfish here. The starfish gets bigger and they sort of eat themselves. They, they absorb the rest of them. And it settles down. But studies done <coughs> in um, aquaria showed that as you get more and more phytoplankton, the chlorophyll measured by chlorophyll, uh, the, if you have sort of normal seawater, the crown of thorns never really fully develops. The larvae don't make it. But once you get over a certain amount, which is pretty thick for a coral reef area, but pretty normal like in Puget Sound or the Grand Banks, but not in, not in the tropical atolls and things, they're uh, nearly all of them uh, survive. So this is another way of looking at it. They're only on high islands, not atolls. Uh, there may be some exceptions, but basically. And they seem to come after a lot of nutrient runoff. And the aquarium studies show that they can't survive in normal seawater. You have to put in more algae. And so I, the story of this is nutrient runoff. And we were talking about the effects of nutrient runoff on the corals. But there's also, uh, has this effect <coughs> that, um, that causes outbreaks of things with hypertrophic development. Also, they, they get bigger if they have more phytoplankton, more algae. Here's a little baby that. Uh, another aspect is crown of thorns is made to um, have these outbreaks because they're very good at growing when they're very small because they have a stomach that comes out their whole with most starfish like uh, Lakia, the blue finger one, and Colcita, the cushion star, they, they have relatively small stomachs. And so this can really change the coral diet and just start to skyrocket. And this, I think, was interesting from a 1900 paper of Asterius in New England. Um, they were the same cohort, but if you get started early and get your first little tiny clam, and you start growing very fast on that one food, then you get to, you're easier to get the next clam, and the next clam, and you get bigger clams. If you don't get that, and it takes several weeks, uh, this is the difference in one cohort started out the same, but this one got them early for his prey. That's just a side point. Life, we, we have grocery stores, but life for those little starfish is very uh, precarious. <clears throat> Another aspect <coughs> of nutrients is uh, the Burdekin River here gets its nutrients from fertilizing the, the uh, sugar cane all over this large area. So there's a lot of nutrients in the water here. But fresh water kind of tends to stay on top, as we already said, from the stratification. And so the, Burdick, the river along the coast here goes up north. By the way, later you'll see it. The middle it comes back, it comes this way. But it comes up, and when it gets to uh, this cave here, it kind of in the area of Green Island tourist area, it goes offshore and it tends to mix in rather than be kind of like a little river going up. And this is where the Crown of Thorns outbreaks start, is around Green Island usually. And here's the discharge over various years out of the Burdekin River. And you can see there's lots and lots of years where it's normal. But when you get a real heavy outflow, the red ones are when you have a major crown thorns outbreak. And so this is yet another perspective on nutrients. Uh, this is my favorite nutrient story. But you know, nutrients make a huge difference in coral reefs. And one of the ways is crown thorns. Now, Cairns is where the uh, Green Island is, and this is where they start. Oddly enough, every three years, there's another outbreak, and it goes down. And remember, I said the current carrying the nutrients goes up this side and then goes out, but there's a current going down from the north. And every three years, it takes three years for the crown. I should have shown you that in the map here. 
it takes about 36 months to spawn. Uh, because you're a little coral, I mean, you're a little crown of thorns, and it takes you that long to get big enough. And that's why you suddenly see them. They come out of hiding about three years. And when they do that, they spawn. Now, this probably isn't nutrients. It's just, there are just so many of them. And they're all spawning billions. And I'm out of time. Okay. Ah, I keep wanting to say that. Anyway, there's tons of nutrients coming in the dust from continents to continents. And uh, Hawaii is really an interesting place. There's a story, or the, a nature article, about how the Hawaiian islands lose by leaching nutrients of calcium and calcium over the years. So you get an old island that has much of certain chemicals, but the others come and they build up. And it's really fascinating how, how young islands are nutrient, uh, are nitrogen limited, old islands are phosphorus limited because of this mix of leaching and they change a lot of time. And uh, we'll Thank you. Almost done.